Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Rise of Industrial Robots and Increased Overdose and Disability Rates, a story of automation and addiction in the US. This webinar is brought to you today by the Center for Financial Security, Retirement and Disability Research Center. This webinar is being recorded and the recording and slides will be posted on our website, cfs.wisc.edu within two business days. And you can also expect to receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to the recording. My name is Hallie Leinhart, and I am the Assistant Director of the Center for Financial Security here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Just to provide a bit of a rundown on our event today, we will start with a research presentation of study background methods and findings, and then we will hear from discussants from a policy and practice perspective. We will then move into a Q&A with the presenters, so please do feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar in the chat or question box located on the right side of your screen. I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers for our webinar today. Athindar Venkataramani is an assistant professor at the Perlman School of Medicine and Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at the University of Pennsylvania. Rourke O'Brien is an assistant professor of sociology and faculty fellow at the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale University. Tisa Marie Sherry is an associate physician policy researcher at RAND Corporation. And Marsha Galvin is project coordinator for Support to Communities at the Southwest Wisconsin Workforce Development Board. Thank you all for being here today. And with that, let's go ahead and get started, and I will turn it over to Rourke and Athene. Great, thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. And um, I have the benefit of getting us kicked off here with um, our paper on uh, automation, mortality, and disability claiming in the United States. Um, just as a uh, kind of a thank you, first to the CFS for having us, and secondly to the US Social Security Administration, which funded this through a consortium. All these views are our own. All right, so getting into this. There we go. So we'd like to first set this up by talking about what we call the American mortality crisis. And what this graph shows is the calendar year uh, and the age-adjusted mortality rate per 100,000 working age persons, who we define as 18 to 65 year old men and women. And we've divided, this is data at the county level, which we've divided into three groups. Um, those that have the highest uh, levels of education on average, um, which is this uh, solid line, those that have the median level of education in the United States, which is this middle line, and those that have the lowest level of average uh, educational attainment, which is this top line. And throughout the last 50 years, uh, those with lower levels of education have had worse health outcomes as shown by higher rates of mortality. But since about 1980, the gap between the lowest and highest educated counties has grown markedly. Uh, in fact, in the places that have the lowest levels of average education among working age adults, mortality rates today are higher than what they were in 1980, which is a total reversal of a large secular decline. And the reason is, uh, well, the question is, what's happening with this? Why is this happening? I'll show you another uh, graph here, which is basically the rise in disability claims. So this is people applying for um, disability benefits, whether it's a social security disability insurance program or the supplemental security income program. And what you see here is that among uh, workers, uh, there are now, uh, there's now a huge increase in the number of workers, in the share of workers rather, that have uh, claimed disability. And that this increase has actually materialized over the same time span, 1980 onwards, over which we saw this increase in mortality. So what's going on? The hypothesis that we have is that the reason that lower, uh, less educated workers, or that is workers without a college education, are doing worse in terms of health and disability is that economic opportunities for them have faded. We define economic opportunity uh, as basically the chance to move up the income ladder through better occupations and human capital investment. 
But what we know from Raj Shetty's work is that economic mobility, whether you'll do better than your parents, has actually fallen in the United States um, or since actually the uh, 1950s and reached one of its nadirs for the 1980 birth cohort, which happens to be my birth cohort. So I just want to quickly tell you that our lab uh, that Rourke and I started called the Opportunity for Health Lab actually looks at this question and tries to understand the many different ways in which economic opportunity might influence health. And this particular paper is one of those, uh, one of the research projects of that lab. So let's talk about economic opportunity and why it might be falling. There are two things that have been mentioned a lot in the news and in public policy debates. One is the increasing exposure of US labor markets to trade with other countries, such that low wage workers in the United States are facing competition from foreign workers. The second one is automation, which is what we're gonna talk about a little bit more in depth, but basically this is replacing human labor uh, potentially with uh, labor from uh, artificial intelligence or robots. And these two forces are thought to hit hardest those without a college degree, the very people who are suffering most in terms of worse health outcomes. So the, this paper tries to connect one of these forces uh, in a causal way to what might be happening to health outcomes. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use newly available data on automation in the United States to look at what happens in labor market areas with increasing levels of automation in terms of their mortality rates and disability claiming rates. Um, there has been very little research to date that has looked at this specific question. Um, this research actually is complementary to a growing literature though that has looked at the relationship between trade and mortality finding that higher exposure to foreign trade uh, has led to increased mortality among lower wage uh, workers and less educated workers. Rourke is gonna get into this in more detail, but what we're going to find is that greater automation causally leads to higher mortality. Uh, and a lot of this is with drug overdose and suicide and particularly among middle-aged men and women. And we also show that greater automation leads to higher rates of disability claiming. And we will also talk about what are the possible ways that we can kind of intervene on this relationship between automation and mortality such that it doesn't have to be a truism for American society. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rourke. Perfect. Thanks, uh, thanks Athene, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. So when we're talking about automation, and we're, we're talking about robots. So we thought it'd be helpful to give a little picture of the robots we're talking about here. So here, we're not thinking so much about kind of cyborgs like you see kind of the lower right hand side of this picture, but instead these uh, industrial robots, the type of thing that you would see on manufacturing floors. So you can think of these as reprogrammable uh, machines that can be uh, quite versatile, can be used to do a bunch of different tasks that were previously done by human workers. So when we think about the rise of industrial robots, a big part of the uh, puzzle is, you know, what is the impact on workers that are displaced and on those communities that rely heavily on manufacturing uh, uh, industries? Second slide forward. So this is a map showing um, uh, across U.S. commuting zones the uh, predicted increase in exposure to automation between 1993 and 2007. So that's that 15-year window is our focus of our study period. Uh, so darker colors here correspond to areas that saw a greater increase in uh, uh, robot, industrial robot adoption. So no real surprises here. We see the darkest colors are largely concentrated in the industrial Midwest, so Michigan, Ohio, Indiana. Uh, and it also stretches, of course, back to the industrial cities of the Northeast, so parts of Pennsylvania, upstate New York, New Jersey, et cetera. Um, so that's, of course, no surprise because that's where a lot of the heavy uh, goods producing industries uh, in the United States are located, particularly the automotive industry, which is uh, a major user of industrial robots and a major adopter over this time period. Um, but we also want to underscore that there is actually quite a bit of variation across the country. So even outside those regions, we see hotspots of uh, robot usage in uh, parts of the South um, uh, and even in places like the Texas coast and all far west into California. So even though this is a trend that is absolutely concentrated and most heavily impacting those sectors that are located in that industrial Midwest and Northeast, um, this is something that we do see affecting industries uh, across the country. So uh, looking at this map, what we're estimating here is just the uh, 
uh, increase in, uh, industrial robots per 1,000 workers. So across all commuting zones over that 15 year period that we're looking at, the average increase was about two additional industrial robots per 1,000 workers, and the median is about one and a half robots, just to give you a sense of the overall scale there. Okay, so I wait for the slide. Perfect. So the data from that map actually came from the study that they mentioned um, by Asamoglu and Restrepo, which was published in 2020. So in this remarkable paper, um, these two economists uh, wanted to understand the labor market impacts of industrial robot adoption in the United States. So in that study, they found a fourfold increase in the number of industrial robots over that 15 year window from 93 to 2007. Uh, and they traced that effect uh, to labor markets and found it led to a loss of between 400,000 and 750,000 jobs. So a lot of the workers were of course displaced in manufacturing, but of course that weakens the, the whole ecosystem of local economies. So they also see um, job losses in kind of the service sectors in those communities as well. But it's not just job losses. So in that paper, they also found a decrease in overall employment and a decrease in average wages, even among those folks who were lucky enough to keep their jobs. So it was that paper where we saw such dramatic labor market, neg negative labor market effects of industrial robot adoption that led us to think, well, there probably, there must be knock-on consequences for population health, given the, the tight coupling we know between economic trends and economic vitality and overall health patterns. So for our study, we actually adopted the same causal identification strategy that uh, Asimoglu and Restrepo use in their paper. Uh, and here, um, we won't get into the, uh, all the details, but the idea is we're using a measure of the predicted robot penetration across local area commuting zones if the industries in those areas adopted robots at similar pace that we see in a, in a, in a set of European countries. So this is just taking advantage of the fact that uh, European countries were early adopters in the use of industrial robots. Uh, and so they actually led the United States uh, in this regard. Uh, and so using a measure from uh, Europe allows us to get that nice kind of measure, uh, exogenous measure of robot adoption, which is particularly important when we're interested in trying to suss out the causal connection here. So just to develop the intuition a little bit, if we were to just look at the relationship between uh, robot adoption in the US uh, and mortality in the US, we might have our causal direction uh, a bit confused, right? Because we can imagine a story by which, say, the US working age population is getting less healthy, uh, and that leads uh, uh, industries to adopt robots more readily, right? So then the causal direction be going the other way. So a lot of what this identification strategy is doing by relying on trends in uh, outside of the US is allowing us to really make sure we feel uh, confident that the causal arrow is going from robots to whatever our health outcome. Um, and finally, just a few more specifics. So we're gonna be looking at uh, the effect of the change in robot adoption between 1993 and 2007 on the change in age-adjusted age mortality rates uh, for men and women of different age groups. So our uh, measure of the robot adoption is at the commuting zone or kind of metropolitan area level, uh, but we're gonna use more fine-grained data on mortality rates, looking at that at the county level. Okay, so now turning to results. So just to orient you to these figures, so I'll be presenting a, a couple of slides of these. What we're showing here is um, just the estimated coefficient. This is just the effect of one additional robot per 1,000 workers on mortality in each of these age groups, uh, these age sex groups. Uh, and we're gonna look at mortality both at top, of, up top has the all-cause all mortality, so that's just overall mortality. And then we also disaggregate uh, by different causes of death. So a few things uh, uh, to, to point out in this initial set of estimates, looking at men uh, aged 20 to 29 and men aged 30 to 44. Uh, first and foremost, we do see positive point estimates uh, for all cause mortality, although mortality is still relatively uh, uh, rare in this, in this population uh, subgroup because they're quite young. So, so we can't say uh, definitively that uh, that effect is different from zero for the overall rates. Um, but we do see pretty clear evidence of an uptick in drug overdose mortality. Uh, and here are these point estimates, uh, uh, when we think about the fact that um, this is showing the effect for one additional robot, and if we remember the mean across all of our commuting zones was about two additional robots per 1,000 workers. So if we, if we take that average and multiply it out, we see that um, uh, robot penetration leads to an increase in drug overdose mortality for these groups 
that's equal to about 13% uh, of the overall increase in drug overdose mortality for men aged 20 to 29, and about 20% of the overall increase in drug overdose mortality for men aged 30 to 44. So it actually, it actually explains a pretty sizable uh, segment of that overall uh, uh, uptake in drug overdose mortality that, of course, we've all been paying uh, quite a bit of attention to in recent years. So now we're going to look at uh, the estimates for slightly older uh, age groups of men. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have uh, uh, the estimates on mortality for males aged 45 to 54. Uh, here we see a, a large uh, hit, um, a large effect on mortality. It's the largest estimate of, of the bunch. Um, uh, and this, here we find that one additional robot is associated uh, with an increase of uh, about eight additional deaths per 100,000. Um, and if we multiply that out, that, that tells us that, that, that this adoption of industrial robots accounts for about 25% of the overall rise in mortality for this uh, age group. Uh, and if you recall, this is the age group that's received uh, quite a bit of attention uh, in recent decades, I mean, in recent years, uh, for having kind of stagnating and even worsening mortality outcomes. So this is pretty good evidence that, that the rise of industrial robots and this worker displacement uh, is a major driver of that trend. Uh, so that's the top line number with all cause. When we disaggregate it by cause of death, we do see um, significant upticks for drug overdose mortality uh, and suicide mortality uh, among those men. Uh, and the suicide um, estimate, um, which again, thankfully, is a, is a relatively rare event, um, but that, so that coefficient actually translates into quite a large overall effect. So we find evidence that um, uh, industrial robot adoption accounts for about 50% of the increase in suicide mortality for males aged 45 to 54. When we look at the slightly older age group of men, uh, we again see a large but less precisely esti estimated effect for that all-cause group, uh, and some evidence again for drug overdose mortality. Uh, and here was a kind of interesting and surprising association uh, as we saw an increase in uh, mortality due to cardiovascular uh, uh, disorders. So turning now to uh, uh, women. So women uh, in this age group of age 20 to 29, here again, we see an impact on the overall all-cause mortality rate. Uh, and if you look uh, further down that figure, you'll see that's being driven largely by increases in drug overdose mortality. Um, we don't see quite as strong a signal for uh, women age 30 to 44, although notably here, we do see some uh, uh, impacts on cancer uh, mortality. Uh, which was surprising from the outset. Now turning to women of slightly older age groups. So here again, eight women aged 45 to 54, we see again that strong signal on all-cause mortality, mirroring what we saw for men of the same age group. Uh, and we see a, a large, but again, imprecisely estimated effect for the slightly older age group of women aged uh, 55 to 64. Of course, the United States is a very large and heterogeneous country, so we were interested in exploring potential uh, heterogeneity in these effects, depending on features of local areas. So there are three things we considered. One was social safety net policies, one was, and the other was labor market policies. Both of those, we were looking at variation in policies at the state level. And the last was looking at local area prescription opioid supply. So first, on the safety net policies. So we did find some evidence that the effect of automation on drug overdose and suicide mortality was greatest in states with less generous Medicaid programs. So more states with more generous Medicaid uh, 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 programs with its eligibility or benefits, we actually saw a less of an, of an impact of, of um, uh, robot adoption on mortality. We also saw that the generosity of local of state unemployment insurance assistance programs uh, also mitigated the effect on suicide mortality. So that gives us some sense that, that, that the policy environment of individual states can play an important role of moderating the effect of uh, industrial robot adoption on population health. Looking at labor market policies, we found some evidence uh, uh, that suicide, the effect on suicide mortality was lower in states with a higher minimum wage. Uh, and we also saw some evidence that the effect of automation on mortality, particularly drug overdose mortality, was higher in states with right to work laws. So here we're thinking about how suites of labor market policies might affect uh, the uh, overall quantity and quality of jobs in the local ecosystem, which is gonna, we think, have an important uh, effect, determinant effect on uh, uh, whether or not the arrival of industrial robots 
uh, reduces opportunity so far that it would show up in some of these health outcomes, particularly mortality. And finally, we looked at the, the level of local prescription opioid supply. On here, as you would expect, we found that the effect of automation on drug overdose mortality is higher in areas with relatively more prescription opioids per capita. So all of these are really, I think, suggestive and, and hopefully informative for how we should think about potential policy mitigators going forward. So as the theme mentioned, we were also interested in what is the effect of automation on demand for disability assistance. And so here we looked at both uh, applications for both SSDI and SSI disability uh, programs. Uh, and what we see is we uh, a very strong overall signal that uh, uh, increasing uh, penetration of industrial robots is associated with a rather large increase in applications for these two programs. Uh, but then when we actually follow those applications through the determination process, we see almost that all of that increase in overall applications is being driven by an increase in applications that are ultimately denied. Um, so we think that that might be, again, more evidence about uh, 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 potential uh, increases in despair and lack of opportunities that arise from uh, the penetration of industrial robots in a lot of these uh, manufacturing communities. So just to briefly summarize our results. So we find a robust link between automation and mortality among working age, middle-aged persons, uh, particularly increases in drug overdose mortality. Uh, our findings, uh, our point estimates are rather large. We found rather large effects for the adoption of robots on mortality, but in many ways, it's very much in line with the large negative labor market impacts that, that uh, Osamoglu and Restrepo estimated, as well as this larger body of work that, that finds the negative, strong negative health consequences uh, uh, to the decline in this manufacturing sector. We also found some evidence of moderation as a function of social safety net program generosity and labor market policies, as well as the importance of keeping in mind the overall supply of opioids uh, in, in determining the, the level of uh, drug overdose mortality. We also, of course, found that similar uh, uh, impact on disability program applications. Uh, this, too, is consistent with, with previous studies looking at the uh, effect of economic shocks on demand for disability assistance. Um, so this is very much consistent with that work. Uh, and overall, uh, we think these findings are important, not, not just for understanding how we got here and how automation might be contributing to that kind of worrying rise in working age mortality that we've seen among certain uh, subpopulations, but we also think it has important applications for the future, because by all estimates, we expect to see increasing automation across industries uh, in the years and decades to come. So with that, I want to thank everyone and turn it over to Tisa Marie to start our discussion. Hi, everyone. I'm Tisa Sherry. Um, I'm so grateful to be able to participate in the discussion around this really terrific study that Athene and Rourke have presented. I'm going to briefly discuss some of the important policy implications that their work raises. All right, so the central finding here that automation has contributed to a behavioral health crisis is really troubling, but is consistent with a growing literature showing that economic shifts that displace large numbers of workers can have profound effects on health outcomes. These findings are important because they have the potential to really reframe how we understand and how we talk about the impacts of economic policy. Um, there's been a lot of discussion recently about the effects of automation in policy and political debates, but these have focused primarily on um, the impacts of automation on jobs and income, which are certainly very important. But I think this research is an important reminder to us that major labor market changes have even more far-reaching consequences, including on health, that also have to factor into the public debate. Now, given, as Rourke pointed out, automation is expected to increase, the studies are really timely warning for us of some of the challenges that might await us if we don't try to act to offset and address some of the potential harmful health consequences that it could create. Now, fortunately, another really great thing about this study is that it identifies some potential opportunities for intervention. Um, so safety net programs such as Medicaid, unemployment insurance, and labor market policies to increase worker pay and support collective bargaining power uh, can mitigate some of the harms of job loss. 
So I'll review what role these and other policy responses can play in addressing behavioral health crisis facing displaced workers in their communities. I'll start by reviewing the most proximal policies uh, that address health needs. I'll then review some of the economic policies and safety net programs that can affect the social determinants of health. Uh, I'll talk about how we can better connect individuals with existing services that might benefit them. And then finally, I'll close by discussing how in the longer term, um, I think a lot of this evidence points to a need to develop more robust collaboration between different aspects of the safety net. So starting with health needs, this study demonstrates very clearly that economic decline is a health policy issue, um, and in addition to, of course, an economic policy issue, and it requires some health policy responses. So one clear implication of these findings is that there's a need for an expansion of behavioral health treatment capacity and targeting of these investments specifically to communities that are affected by large-scale economic change and hardship. Now, the next um, kind of takeaway I had um, was the real importance of addressing stigma as a barrier to mental health and substance use disorder treatment. And the reason I raised this is that I was really struck by Athene and Rourke's finding that the largest increases in mortality were in general found among men, which is a consistent finding across other studies looking at the impacts of economic decline. We know from other research that men are less likely than women to seek treatment for behavioral health health conditions, in part because of increased internalized stigma around these conditions. So to effectively engage all people um, in care, but also in in particular um, men suffering from behavioral health conditions, we have to develop approaches to more effectively decrease stigma around mental illness and substance use disorder. But treatment alone um, isn't enough. You know, I think since we know, based on this great study and based on um, you know the other terrific work that Athena and Rourke cited, that um, this is a very high-risk population, we also have to act upstream by investing in prevention efforts. Now, one challenge um, in this area that I, I need to acknowledge is that most of the evidence that we have on effective prevention programs and policies comes from programs targeting teens, not middle-aged adults. Um, this population hasn't really been on our radar until, you know, um, this more recent body of evidence showing the decline um, in mortality, the decline in life expectancy in midlife. So this is an area where we really need more evidence to inform our policy efforts. Last, um, we need treatment to be um, accessible and affordable, um, which requires affordable health insurance options that are not tied to employment for obvious reasons, because this is a population undergoing job displacement, and behavioral health parity enforcement, given um, you know, the kind of particular preponderance of uh, behavioral health problems, including suicide risk uh, and overdose. And here there's robust evidence to support the value of health insurance. The Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, which was a randomized study of the impacts of expanded Medicaid eligibility, for example, found that it resulted in a 30% decline in depression incidence. Um, very hot off the press, so hot off the press that it didn't make it onto my slides, um, uh, but there's a newly published study um, by Sarah Miller and colleagues in the Quarterly Journal of Economics um, finding that Medicaid expansions um, resulted in decreased mortality. Um, so you know, clearly, um, uh, providing the underlying healthcare infrastructure to then support access to evidence-based treatment um, is a critical health policy investment to address these vulnerable communities undergoing economic decline. Health policy responses are critical, but they're not enough because as this research shows, health and economic security are deeply interconnected. So we also need to consider targeted expansions and safety net programs addressing broader needs, especially those for which there's evidence of health benefits. Uh, for example, um, there uh, are, is evidence that minimum wage increases and increased unemployment generosity um, uh, are linked to lower suicide mortality specifically. There's evidence of uh, an impact of housing assistance and nutrition support on health improvements more broadly. As we consider the various investments we might make in the safety net, or as we consider labor policy reforms, there are some important um, you know, questions and areas where we could really use more ever, evidence to better guide our policy making. Um, so uh, for example, 
what combination of programs and policies should we put together and target to most efficiently meet a community's needs? How should that assistance be targeted? Um, who are the community members at highest risk? Who uh, benefits the most um, from particular interventions? What are the equity implications of different um, modifications to the safety net that we might make? And in particular, you know, what sorts of impacts um, you know, might these reforms have on historically disadvantaged communities, for example, communities of color? Um, and we also need to know a little bit more about heterogeneity in terms of how communities are affected. And so by that, I mean, um, you know, a lot of the research in this area has measured community level outcomes in general at the county level because that's where data is available. Um, but it would be important to know whether impacts differ among different um, you know, groups of individuals. Um, so, for example, um, uh, in this case, are the uh, health, uh, are the adverse health outcomes we're seeing driven primarily by the displaced workers themselves, or are they driven by spillovers to other members of the community? You know, the answer there is important in terms of helping us figure out where we're going to target our policy efforts, whether we focus only on people undergoing job loss or whether there are other people in the community who we have to um, take into account as well. And it might inform the types of investments that we need to make. Um, and last, in figuring out where to make investments in the safety net, I think we need to take a broader approach to measuring the social cost effectiveness of these interventions. For example, um, I'm sure um, we, we all recall recent um, public debates about, um, about the generosity of uh, unemployment insurance and changes that were made under the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you'll recall, a lot of those, uh, in a lot of those debates, um, this was framed primarily as a trade-off between supporting household consumption on the one hand and work disincentives on the other hand. But as this study and others show, health and you know, maybe even impacts on you know, other areas of uh, social well-being also need to be part of the equation when we figure out where um, our investments give us the most bang for buck. And then finally, many of the people who are affected by um, job displacement placement, um, who live in uh, communities experiencing economic decline, have families. Um, and accurately measuring social cost effectiveness also requires taking into account what we know about the multi-generational impacts of poverty, as Athene alluded to earlier in the presentation, but also what we know about the multi-generational impacts of parental mental illness and substance use. Now, once we have the right programs and policies in place, um, and the next question is, how do we connect individuals with appropriate services that will benefit them? Now, unfortunately, um, it, it's no secret that it is very challenging and burdensome on uh, individuals to navigate the safety net. A lot of our different programs are siloed. Uh, in most places, uh, in most parts of the country, we don't have a coordinated system for connecting um, eligible adults with benefits. Some healthcare organizations have um, you know, actually tried to get out ahead of this um, and have effectively become social service navigation hubs for the patients who come in to see them. Um, and this is a great step, um, but what we really probably need are multiple hubs at any potential point of contact with the safety net to ensure that you know, individuals in need are being directed to the you know, types of services that are most appropriate to them. For example, I was curious when reading this paper, um, what happened to all of um, you know, the people in the study uh, who were denied SSI and SSDI benefits? That interaction they had with the Social Security Administration is a potential opportunity to connect them with other programs for which they're eligible. And I'd be curious to know how often that's actually happening um, in reality. There are a couple of promising examples of efforts to link people with the right services that um, I'll highlight. Um, so one is um, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health um, Services Administration's Outreach, Outreach Access and Recovery Program, the SOAR program. Um, which is um, a, a very successful program that provides um, assistance to individuals who are at particularly high risk of homelessness, in fact, um, so who typically have serious mental illness um, and or comorbid substance use disorder, um, with assistance in filling out their SSI and their SSDI applications. Um, uh, another example um, is an ongoing demonstration being sponsored by the Social Security Administration um, called the Supported Employment Demonstration. Um, you know, this demonstration actually targets individuals 
individuals who have applied for but been denied SSI and SSDI um, and provides them with integrated mental health and employment services. Um, so provides an example of you know how we might otherwise um, you know uh, try to uh, connect um, you know people who kind of strike out when looking for assistance in one area with um, uh, with services that are tailored to their needs. So finally, um, I think this study and um, others in this literature you know, really highlight the extent to which economic and health vulnerabilities are interconnected and the fact that to better address them in the longer term, we probably need to better integrate and coordinate safety net programs across multiple sectors, health, education, employment, disability, um, with the goal of um, one-stop shopping for both eligibility determination and service delivery. There are some localities that are move, trying to move in this direction, and some of the ingredients that they've identified as being particularly important for supporting cross-sector collaboration are uh, data sharing and linkages, so different agencies you know, being able to track um, uh, beneficiaries um, across the various programs that they're receiving, um, having shared goals, joint accountability, and oversight of their performance. So um, you know, in this context, for example, um, uh, you know, behavioral health treatment, um, you know, being viewed as not solely the purview of the medical system, but a kind of a joint, uh, a goal over which multiple sectors that touch an individual um, are accountable for. Um, they've also identified cross-training of staff um, in different sectors as really important to helping support um, this uh, collaboration and coordination of services. And then finally, having a single uh, integrated financing stream um, for services so that we can more flexibly deploy funds um, to better support an individual's needs. We're still learning a lot about how to set these collaborations up and how well they can work, um, but some examples of where this has been tried um, include place-based policies. Um, uh, so you may recall this was an Obama-era policy where localities received investments across multiple sectors, which then collaborated to try to improve local economic outcomes. And the, this was primarily um, centered on education and labor um, with a little bit less emphasis on health. But then one uh, final example um, I'll share is um, there's an interesting new Medicaid uh, demonstration, um, which you may have heard of, Integrated Care for Kids, that tries to coordinate services for vulnerable children across a number of different sectors, including health, child welfare, um, education, and others. Now, obviously, this is a very different population um, than uh, that which was um, found to be impacted in this study, but it does give a sense of what might be possible um, you know, for adults. Um, uh, so that's uh, just a brief summary of potential policy responses ranging from some of the more short-term immediate impact policies um, up to longer-term investments we might make. Um, and thank you all so much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marcia. Hi, everyone. Um, I appreciate the invitation um, from CFS to join our work, Athene and Tisa Marie to discuss this topic. I'm very passionate about it. Uh, I'm gonna briefly discuss um, a, a practical application of some of these findings um, and analysis uh, for uh, this particular population and their relation to workforce. Um, I'm the project coordinator with Support to Communities uh, with the Southwest Wisconsin's Workforce Development Board. Um, our board oversees and operates all of the workforce development um, programs in Southwest Wisconsin. Uh, we cover Rock, Green, Grant, Iowa, Lafayette, and Richland counties. Um, all of our services are driven by the local employer um, demands uh, and with our mission is to increase the economic opportunities for the local workforce. Uh, all of our services are available through local job centers. So what is support to communities? Um, this is a program that's 100% funded by the Department of Labor uh, through their support to communities, fostering opiate recovery through workforce development uh, program. Um, and it's intended to help make a difference in the substance use crisis through workforce development. Um, through our partnerships, we are able to provide career services to those in the community that have been impacted by substance use. Um, but it also expands the opportunity um, for behavioral health professionals in Wisconsin who are wanting to uh, 
address that substance use crisis. Um, the grant was about $642,000, um, and we expect to uh, have it through August of 2024. So who's eligible for this program? Um, so we have two types of individuals that are eligible. The first type of individual um, is an individual who has been impacted by substance use. Now, um, that definition is a little bit more broad. Uh, it can be an individual's personal uh, substance use, or it could be a friend or a family member. So perhaps they grew up uh, in, a, a, in a home where substance use was prevalent, um, or maybe they lost a friend to substance use or an overdose. For those individuals, uh, we can provide financial assistance uh, for training and educational resources um, for in-demand occupations that are driven by our local economy. And additionally, we can provide financial resources for supportive services. So that can include something like transportation, childcare, uniforms, um, insurance or medical exams, uh, things like that. Anything to support that individual uh, in their completion of their program or training. Uh, and we also have available some outpatient recovery services for individuals who request it. The second type of worker um, are those who may not have been impacted by substance use or who are not willing to voluntarily disclose that. We understand there is stigma associated with um, you know, disclosing something of that nature. Um, but who want to work with those with substance use disorders or enter that field. So perhaps that is uh, an individual who is working with uh, those who've been impacted by substance use and would like to get their SACIT, which is their substance abuse certificate to become a substance use counselor. Um, eligible workers are those who have been dislocated, uh, maybe their uh, organization closed down or they were laid off, those with barriers to employment, um, including criminal history, substance use, mental health, things like that, or um, those who are new to the workforce without any type of real experience. Um, and those who are currently employed um, or underemployed. So what kind of services do we provide? Uh, once an individual gets enrolled with us, um, we are assigning them a career planner. With that career planner, they work with that individual to gather documents um, for eligibility. They do a career assessment um, to determine what path might look best for them. Um, they do have to, in order for us to pay for um, services or schooling or training or education, something of that nature, we do have to have them matched with that assessment. So that's a really important tool that we use. Um, we uh, provide meaningful referrals uh, for supportive services. Uh, we can assist with covering the cost of those if uh, an organization in the community cannot provide it. Uh, we develop an employment plan with them um, that includes goals, action steps, identified support services, um, and then career services. So if an individual is just looking to um, perhaps uh, get a new job with better benefits or better pay, we can do work readiness with them, resume, interviewing, um, uh, things like that. We also do a benefits analysis with them. Um, we understand that a lot of people are, are using services right now and that uh, obtaining employment can have kind of a negative impact um, on their ability to continue providing. And so we do do that benefits analysis to let people know um, this is what you might lose, this is what you will lose, things like that. We provide uh, financial assistance for career services, um, so including that work readiness training programs. So, for example, like a CDL program, um, certificate programs to upskill or retrain an individual, um, educational opportunities, uh, so like a bachelor's, um, associate's degrees, uh, for in-demand positions that are dictated by that labor market data. Uh, we provide financial assistance for those support services for the duration of their training. Uh, their school, their certificate program, and for a minimum of 12 months after they have located employment. So this is really important, again, because sometimes when we get employment, we lose some of those benefits that we really depend on to provide. Um, we offer those recovery assistance uh, for uh, outpatient services. Um, and then we also have the ability to offer training and educational opportunities to industry employers who are interested in becoming second chance employers. So why is employment important in recovery? So the big one, obviously, we get money. We all need money to survive. Um, this, though, gives an individual the ability to participate in their communities um, uh, socially, um, economically, um, and it provides for um, their families, allows them to meet their own needs. Uh, it increases that independence, and it empowers people. Benefits. 
Access to healthcare is critical. Um, substance use and mental health treatment uh, for preventative um, and maintenance measures for an individual to um, maintain their recovery. It's a lifelong journey. Um, paid time off, sick time, retirement, and the ability to plan for their future for what could be the first time in their lives. Um, stability. So for a lot of people in recovery, this could be the first time in a long time or ever that they've had stability, a schedule, responsibilities, a steady source of income, a reason to get out of bed and leave their house each morning. Purpose. Um, meaningful employment can give an individual purpose and allow them to take part in activities that will increase their self-efficacy, their self-worth, um, and their self-esteem, which is really important when we're talking about recovery. Meaningful connection. Um, the opposite of addiction isn't recovery, it's actually connection. Um, so when you have a job, you get to be part of a community. Um, you have the ability to create healthy, stable relationships. Um, most often, recovery requires that an individual starts over from scratch. We have to give up all of the things that you used to do, right? So um, we have to forge new relationships. We have to find new places to live, new communities, new hobbies. Um, employment gives uh, individuals the ability to do a lot of that stuff um, and create healthy relationships and healthy new hobbies and pathways. Um, employment has the power to create these spaces where people can start to heal. Um, when individuals have access to all of them things, uh, all of those things that I just discussed, they can begin that journey. Um, it also normalizes substance use and the belief that people can and do recover. Every person counts. So due to economic growth, uh, the declining birth rates and workforce retirements, it's expected that we're going to have about 11 million uh, people short. We'll be 11 million people short for the labor force by 2030. Um, during that same time, it's expected that the working age population, 15 to 69 for the purposes of this, um, are expected to be uh, reduced by about 1.8 million. This will be further exacerbated if we take into account um, that population 65 to 69, um, the kind I want to retire population, but not sure if I can. Um, if they're able to leave the workforce, that number will be uh, exacerbated by about 3.4 million. So our economic health is going to be dependent on our ability as a nation um, to take an affirmative approach to prevention, recovery, and management of substance use disorders. Um, it's going to matter in how we address every barrier that prevents someone from fully engaging in the workforce. We can't ignore that data that we're going to be 11 million short for some of those critical industries. So it's going to take a coordinated approach as communities, as a nation, to address the complexity of substance use disorders, which includes that impact from family, community, financial, and the workforce, um, and all of that having on that individual's recovery. So with that, I want to thank you all, uh, and I'm going to defer to Hallie for questions. Very good. Thank you so much, um, everyone. That was um, really well done in terms of all of your presentations, how that really came together. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and um, bring us into the, the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, Great, I can see all the webcams are on. Um, so let's let's first start off with a question that I have um, directed for um, towards Athene and Rourke. So this question is around the time frame that you mentioned in your um, in your presentation. So um, 93 to 2007 um, is the era that you're looking at. So do you have any um, do you have any kind of predictions or have you been able to see how this might actually be increasing um, in the next kind of 14 years? Or, and do you have any um, plans to look at that, that era following when, when your study is focused on? Um, just because I'm wondering, um, is I'm assuming that industrial robot use is probably um, speeding up, but I'm just not sure of the rate, and so wondering if you all have some insights on that. I can start. 
Brooke, if that's okay. Um, so I think that's a great question. We had originally chosen the 93 to 2007 um, timeframe, A, because that's uh, when some of the best data was available, but B, also it covers this rise of the opioid crisis nicely, uh, which is a major contributor to increasing mortality among working age adults. Um, as far as automation thereafter, I think there is some data now that goes out to 2014 that does show an acceleration in the rates of adoption of industrial robots, and it is expected that that will continue uh, through the next 10 years. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic may actually play um, a role in speeding up automation. There's a few kind of theoretical papers suggesting that there may be uh, human workers may be riskier. And so as a result, it might be safer to have robots that can't get sick from a, from a novel virus. Um, and on that note, there was an article in Reuters yesterday that Domino's in Houston uh, is having robots deliver pizzas instead of people. So because of this fear of infection risk. And so I think that that's going to continue to increase. Uh, at the same time, we've seen that the opioid crisis has uh, continued to accelerate even through the pandemic. Uh, since 2011, in large part, that was due to the availability of fentanyl. And so I think these two trends um, over time will, uh, my prediction, and I'm curious what work things would be that this kind of dynamic we're seeing will continue to perpetuate um, without some kind of uh, social response to put the brakes on that, um, uh, the types of things Tisa was talking about. As for looking at that data, I I'd love to uh, once we get our hands on it. Yeah, I'll just add that uh, it, one thing will be interesting to watch in the years to come well i think we're going to see technology advancing on multiple fronts right so there's no doubt going to be an acceleration in the adoption of industrial robots uh, as we've seen i think that trend is going to pick up but as Athene mentioned right the idea is that uh we could have automated you know delivery robots uh i think we're uh uh, uh uh, looking at kind of a continued massive restructuring of the U.S. economy. So it's going to be particularly thoughtful just to think through, you know, which classes and categories of workers um, are facing that kind of precarity in the new economy. Uh, and so then how do we uh, effectively design uh, programs and policies such as the ones that are wonderful discussants discussed to really try to get out ahead of those trends. So I think that's going to be kind of important, uh, uh, very, you know, near term research in this area. Mm, okay. Thank, that's great. Thank you. Um, and this this question actually um, kind of piggybacks or I can connect it in some way to what you just mentioned about um, increased automation in other areas. Um, you mentioned dominoes, et cetera. Um, and this this audience member was wondering about um, when you showed that that heat map. Um, so he was wondering why are agricultural counties not showing a similar impact of automation as in manufacturing counties? Hasn't automation impacted agriculture occupations to a similar extent from cultivation to harvest to transportation? Um, can mitigation policies attract support from those counties and states as well? Um, so not sure if you have um, insight into that question, but I think it, it raises a, a valid and excellent point. Yeah, I'll just say I think that's uh, an excellent point. And, and mo mostly we should think about that as a, as a scope condition for our study, right? So we were looking at the uh, mortality impacts of a very particular type of automation, right? These industrial robots that we think of on, on plant floors. Um, so we actually don't include in our study kind of other types of automation technological advances such as is absolutely disrupting the agricultural industry. So uh, I suspect if we kind of had a similar you know, uh, uh, empirical uh, strategy and data on that front, we would probably find uh, similar effects. I think in any industry where uh, we're seeing uh, technology displace workers, particularly uh, uh, you know, less educated low-wage low workers, that we're, we're very likely to see knock-on consequences for worker and population health. Yeah, and on that point, there was a paper um, in the American Economic Review Insights from September of last year um, called Rage Against the Machine, which is a phenomenal title for a paper. Um, but that actually looks at um, the appearance of mechanistic technologies in 19th century England and showed that the appearance of those technologies in, in the jobs that existed then actually led to worker unrest. Um, and, and that used archival historical data. They didn't look at mortality, but I could imagine that you might see some of the same dynamics that we are. Thank you. Okay, so I, I'm um, going to move on to another question and I'll send this one to Tisa first, but then um, 
Rourke, um, Athene, and and Marcia. Also, if you if you all want to weigh in, following especially as it relates to your current study. Um, so knowing that, so we talked about the safety net and um, various program kind of interactions with your findings. Um, and so this question is around um, the availability of opioid treatment programs and how, if you were able to look at in the study, Rourke and Athene, how those might have um, impacted your findings. Did you look at all at the opioid, opioid treatment programs, especially since states do have supplementary regulations um, to the federal rules around those um, clinics or treatment programs. Um, and Tisa, do you have any um, insights? I know you spoke a little bit about um, the availability of programs and things, but do we have any more insights about how how state regulations actually um, impact the findings of this study or larger kind of what we know about uh, mortality and automation, et cetera? Sure. So would you like me to start, Holly, or, or Athena and Rourke first? Yes, I'm going to. Yes. Tisa, you go ahead and start. Um, feel free to then um, let Rourke and Athene weigh in um, after you finish up. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So I think this is an excellent question. Um, you know, are we have there has in recent years been a real drive to try to expand access to treatment for opioid use disorder, substance use disorders more generally. Are we starting to see um, any impacts um, in terms of um, functional status and in particular work related functioning and employment? Um, so, you know, I'm aware of some preliminary work on this topic, um, but I, I would not. Um, uh, in particular, um, I'm aware of some work looking at, um, you know, availability of um, treatment, specialty treatment for opioid use disorder um, and impacts on um, uh, SSDI applications. Um, I think that that study, which is, I think, preliminary at this point, not peer reviewed. Um, you know, did not really find a compelling relationship. Um, uh, but you know that this is a very nascent literature, so I think we don't know very much. It is a really ripe and very important area um, for study. Um, you know, I think we would all agree that um, investments in um, investments in treatment for substance use disorder are critically important. You know. Um, for the health benefits um, they provide in and of themselves. Um, but it certainly does not hurt when making the argument, um, you know, to, um, you know, policymakers um, uh, to, uh, you know, also discuss, you know, the even broader, um, you know, beneficial aspects um, in terms of um, economic livelihoods, um, the social fabric of communities and also, um, you know, impacts on um, on children um, of people who have, um, you know, substance use disorders who we know are also affected. Um, so, I, so unfortunately, I think, um, you know, the literature in this area is still um, it, it is still emerging, um, but um, uh, but it, but it's a really critically um, important topic for study. Um, and you know, I think there is um, there's reason to believe there's reason to be hopeful of a relationship. Um, you know, the one thing I would say is um, we probably, when we do look at it, want to look even beyond the specialty treatment programs. The vast majority of substance use disorder treatment that now happens is actually um, in general medical um, care settings. Um, so that would be kind of one consideration. Um, uh, but, um, but, you know, absolutely, I would love to see more work in this area. Yeah, just to briefly agree with that, um, there's, uh, you know, our, our study period kind of predates a lot of the a lot of the changes that um, Tisa is talking about. So if we were to get more recent data, I think it would be worthwhile to look at this variation. It's a great point. Thank you. Okay, so I I have time for just one more question, and I'm going to direct this at Marsha. Um, and this is just getting kind of, you know, to on the ground. Um, we really appreciate you providing that overview um, and all those details of your program that kind of makes makes this, it really brings it to life for us, I think. Um, so what do you find are some of the greatest, greatest barriers to people accessing um, your program? Do you find that it has more to do with, you know, logistics, transportation, um, even just knowing about the program, things like that? Or are there other barriers that seem to be, you know, a greater challenge for people 
who need to get back on their feet um, to access these services that seem like they can be so helpful in um, integrating them back into the workforce? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, I think, uh, so a, a, a huge part of my job is outreach to those individuals and making sure that I can get to them um, to get them connected to my program as well as the other programs that the board offers. Um, for the most part, I see a lot of co-enrollment because they do qualify for a, a multitude of services that we offer. I think one of the biggest barriers um, right now for COVID um, is that technological aspect um, and also the uh, remote services. We are still all operating remotely, including our career planning services. And that can be difficult for somebody who, um, we are a very paper heavy organization. Um, and so there's a lot of forms that need to be filled out, for example. There's a lot of steps that have to be taken and it can be very overwhelming for somebody um, to be to receive uh, an email of forms um, with, a, with a set of instructions, and then they have to figure out how to print them, how to fill them out, how to get them back. Um, and I think we lose people with that. So I have been um, trying to avoid that barrier, um, meeting with individuals in the community, um, with practicing safe COVID uh, policies as well. Um, but I think that's a, a, a very huge barrier. Um, I also think it's a little bit difficult for people to sometimes uh, look at that long-term uh, sort of plan. Um, a lot of people just need jobs now, right? We need to pay our bills now. We need uh, healthcare services now. We need that recovery services um, to sort of speak to the previous question. Wisconsin, um, five of my six counties that I serve are under a designated mental health professional shortage area designated by the federal government. About 52 counties, I think, in the state of Wisconsin, the last time I checked, fall under that category, which means we just don't have the ability to meet the needs of those that we're serving. So when somebody wants help, there's often this disconnect um, between I need help and having access to it. And it can be many, many weeks. Um, it can be months in some cases. And so uh, when we're talking about something as serious as an opiate disorder, um, that can be the difference between life and death. And so um, I think a lot of times, again, I go, just going back to seeing that long term, um, that if I go to school, you know, if I go to school, I can get a good job, um, benefits, and, and if I can upskill, but people really need to kind of see something more immediate. So I think it speaks to being able to provide supportive services for an individual to be able to um, access some of those services that will allow them that economic advancement opportunity. Thank you. That I feel like was a really nice wrap up um, for for our webinar today. Um, thank you so much to Athene, Rourke, Tisa, and Marsha. Um, really valuable information provided by all of you. And I do just want to remind our audience, um, thank you all for tuning in, that this was recorded. I will be posting this on our website and you'll receive a follow-up link. And with that, I just would like to wish everybody um, a nice rest of your week. And um, thanks again for tuning in.